Hello and welcome everyone to this year's HK45 annual update. Uh, we have a very ambitious agenda today. Uh, we have one hour covering a range of very interesting topics. Uh, we have a great lineup of speakers today. Um, we'll start off with uh, Yvonne Sheck from Clifford Chance. Um, Yvonne is an arbitration and international disputes lawyer um, working in the Greater China and Asia Pacific region for 10 years. And Yvonne will be talking to us about some case law updates in Hong Kong and Singapore. And after Yvonne, we'll hear from Kitty Chang uh, from Sherman and Sterling. Um, she'll be telling us more about conditional fees development um, in Hong Kong and in Singapore. And next up, we'll have Yishan Tio from RPC. Um, Yishan will be telling us what he's been seeing um, in terms of dispute resolution uh, in light of the COVID-19 crisis, or some may say COVID-19 challenge. And last but certainly not least, we have Edward Liu from Hill Dickinson. Edward is one of the first practitioners uh, who have handled uh, uh, an application under the groundbreaking mainland China Hong Kong interim measures arrangement. So we'll hear from Edward um, on his uh, insights. And to introduce myself, uh, I am Joanne Lau. I'm a member of the HK45 committee. Um, I'm an off counsel at Ellen Overy. So before we start, um, I'll cover a few housekeeping points. Uh, this session is being recorded. Um, the lines of the audience are muted, um, but there is a Q&A chat box. Um, uh, a Q&A chat box uh, uh, in the Zoom function. So if you have any questions, uh, do feel free to type in the box um, and you'll be dealing with questions um, at the end. So without further ado, um, I'll pass on to uh, Yvonne to cover case law updates. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'll be talking about the case law developments um, in the past year. I'll focus on Hong Kong, but also lightly touch on Singapore. Um, and given the time constraints, I'm going to focus on four relatively topical issues which have come up before both the Hong Kong and the Singapore courts in the past year. Um, let me just change the slide so we can see what those topics are. Um, so I'll start with the first topic um, whilst we're updating the slides. The first topic is the interface between winding up proceedings and arbitration. Now, the question that the courts have been um, dealing with recently is what should be the approach if a winding up application is brought on the basis of a disputed debt that is subject to an arbitration agreement? Now, many of you in Hong Kong will probably, be re will probably remember that um, Justice Harris actually already set down the position um, in Las Moss back in 2018. Just to recap, um, Justice Harris held that a winding up petition should generally be dismissed if three conditions are met. Firstly, the company disputes the debt um, relied on by the petitioner. Secondly, the contract between the parties which gives rise to the debt uh, contains an arbitration clause. And thirdly, the company um, takes the necessary steps to commence arbitration. Now, in the past year, there have been a number of cases uh, seeking to clarify these three requirements. And also, in particular, the Court of Appeal has expressed some reservations about the LASMOS approach. But just bear in mind that all of these were in Urbita. So for the time being, LASMOS is still good law. As an example, in the Dayang Marine shipping case, the court said that the company would still need to demonstrate a bona fide dispute about the debt and the commencement of arbitration proceedings um, might be relevant evidence to show that there is a bona fide dispute about the debt, but it's not determinative. As for the Court of Appeal, um, in Butkachon and Interactive Brokers, and this was mentioned in the Golden Oasis case, the Court of Appeal expressed res reservations about the LASMOS approach um, and it seems that in a nutshell, the Court of Appeal was slightly concerned that the LASMOS approach seemed to go a bit too far in terms of favoring arbitration at the expense of curtailing creditors' statutory rights to wind up a, a company which is in fact insolvent. Turning then to Singapore, 
Um, this issue has been recently settled by the Singapore Court of Appeal in the An An Group case and the BWG case, which were heard together. So where a winding up petition is brought on the basis of a disputed debt that's subject to an arbitration agreement, the Singapore courts will apply the prima facie standard of review. Um, what this means is that the winding up petition will be stayed or dismissed if there's a valid arbitration agreement between the parties and the debt um, or the dispute over the debt falls within the scope of that arbitration agreement provided, and this is the third requirement, provided that the dispute is not being raised by the company as an abusive process. But the Singapore courts were also quite careful in making clear that um, in considering whether there has been an abusive process, they will not examine the merits of the dispute. I'll then turn to the next topic. So a second topic, this is anti-suit injunctions, stay of proceedings, and how that affects third parties. Now on the Hong Kong side, the Dixon Valora case has been quite interesting as the Hong Kong courts effectively granted an anti-suit injunction, which binds third parties. Um, just to briefly summarize the facts of that case, uh, Dixon Valora was a joint venture company and it was party to a shareholders agreement that contained an arbitration agreement. Mr. Fan, the defendant here, was not a party to the shareholders agreement, but he sought to enforce certain payments under the shareholders agreement, and he did so by bringing proceedings before the mainland Chinese courts. So Dixon Valora then applied to the Hong Kong courts for an anti-suit injunction against Mr. Fan on the basis of the arbitration agreement in the shareholders agreement. So as a first step, the Hong Kong courts held that the arbitration in the shareholders agreement does actually extend to bind Mr. Fan, notwithstanding that prima facie he wasn't a party to it. And this was on the basis that Mr. Fan was seeking to enforce payments under the shareholders agreement. So he was seeking a benefit under the shareholders agreement. Therefore, he was also bound by the conditions um, and the obligations imposed under the shareholders agreement, which includes the arbitration clause. Um, now, it was on that basis, by extending the scope um, of this arbitration agreement, that the Hong Kong courts then granted an anti-suit injunction, restraining Mr. Fan from pursuing his claims before the mainland Chinese courts. Turning briefly to Singapore, um, the Rex International case involved a similar factual matrix. So there was a joint venture company and a shareholders agreement providing for arbitration and also separate court proceedings against a third party who was not party to the shareholders, uh, the shareholders agreement or the arbitration clause. But in that case, um, the Singapore courts found actually that the court claims did not arise under the shareholders agreement. So they were really third party claims fairly separate from the shareholders agreement and the arbitration agreement. So on that basis, the Singapore Court of Appeal found that there should not have been any stay of the court proceedings in favor of arbitration. I'll move on then to the third topic, um, which has been considered by the courts, both in Hong Kong and Singapore, and that's applications to set aside arbitral awards on public policy grounds. Now, both, in both the Hong Kong and Singapore cases, they involved applicants trying to set aside arbitral awards on the basis that the underlying agreements were illegal and it would be contrary to public policy to enforce an award based on an illegal contract. So essentially that's um, Article 34 to b of the Ancestral Model Law. In the Singapore case, the tribunal had actually already made a factual finding that the underlying contract was not illegal. So um, in this case, there was actually no need for the court to consider the illegality argument in the setting aside application. In the Hong Kong case, um, Justice Mimi Chang, she found that the plaintiff had also not properly established that the underlying agreement was illegal, but the court went further and found that even if there was an illegal contract, the plaintiff had been aware of the entire arrangement and had actually acted in concert with the defendant. So in these circumstances, the court said that to set aside that award would effectively allow the plaintiff to um, rely on his own wrongdoing and avoid his contractual obligations. And Justice Mimi Chan held that it was um, against Hong Kong public policy in these circumstances to set aside the award. And so she refused to do so. 
Now I'll move on then to the fourth and last topic that I'm going to talk about. That's enforcement and anti-enforcement measures. Um, on the Hong Kong side, the recent La Dolce Vita decision has been quite notable as it's one of the few cases and probably one of the first arbitration cases in which the Hong Kong courts gave a Hadkinson order. Um, that's an order which effectively prevents a person who is in contempt of court from himself bringing an application and being heard by the court until he has remedied the contempt. In this case, the relevant background is that back in 2018, um, Ms. Zhang, so one of the respondents, she had been found to be in contempt of the Hong Kong courts for failing to comply with asset disclosure orders set out in an earlier Mareva injunction granted by the court. Fast forward then to 2020, the claimant had obtained a CTAC award against Ms. Zhang and was trying to enforce that award in Hong Kong. Ms. Zhang and the other respondents then applied to the Hong Kong courts um, seeking to set aside the enforcement order and or otherwise to stay the enforcement proceedings. And in response then, the claimant sought the Hadkinson order effectively to prevent Ms. Zhang from pursuing her application until she had made good her earlier contempt of the Hong Kong courts. Now, one of the issues which the court considered was whether Ms. Zhang's um, application, whether she was merely defending against the enforcement proceedings or whether she was actually on the offense, so essentially seeking relief from the Hong Kong courts. And it was held that by applying to set aside the enforcement order or otherwise to stay the enforcement, Ms. Zhang was actually seeking assistance from the Hong Kong courts, so she was seeking relief. And on that basis, and also considering um, various other arguments, the court then granted the Hadkinson order um, which prevented Ms. Zhang from further pursuing her application to stay the enforcement proceedings um, until she complied with the earlier asset disclosure orders in the Mareva injunction. Finally then turning to Singapore quite briefly, the Sun Travel case, it had an interesting discussion um, about the difference between anti-suit injunctions and anti-enforcement injunctions. Now in a nutshell, the Singapore courts held that the bar for an anti-enforcement injunction is much higher than that for an anti-suit injunction. Um, an anti-enforcement injunction would only be granted in exceptional circumstances, for example, where the foreign judgment had been obtained by fraud um, or where the applicant had no knowledge of the foreign proceedings. So essentially what was required was something to explain the delay in trying to injunct the foreign court proceedings. Now in that case, the Hilton Hotels was seeking to challenge a court judgment that had been given by the Maldives court contrary to the party's arbitration agreement. Now, unfortunately, by the time Hilton went to the Singapore courts, it was too late for an anti-suit injunction um, because the Maldives court had already issued judgment and it, had, um, it also failed to obtain the anti-enforcement injunction because it did not meet the high legal threshold. Um, on that note, I will stop and let others speak. I'm happy to take any questions at a later stage. Thank you, Yvonne. So for our next topic, I'll be talking to you about developments in Hong Kong and Singapore with regard to conditional fees. In August last year, the Singapore Ministry of Law issued a consultation paper on proposals to allow conditional fees in arbitration proceedings. Soon after that, in October, Hong Kong also announced that a subcommittee will be set up to consider the introduction of outcome-related fee structures for arbitration. Now, in the past 20 years or so, other common law jurisdictions have gradually welcomed the use of outcome-dependent fees, mainly on public interest grounds that it would increase access to justice and also better align the attorney's interests with the clients. So now, conditional fees are permitted in the UK, Canada, Australia, and of course in the US. In Asia, also, jurisdictions including mainland China, South Korea, and Japan also permit variations of conditional fees. So given this background and, and the fact that both Hong Kong and Singapore legislated in 2017 to permit third-party funding in arbitration, it's not really surprising that both jurisdictions are now moving towards allowing conditional fees as well. 
And since at the moment we don't have a lot of information on what the reforms in Hong Kong would look, would look like, I will use the consultation paper in Singapore as a roadmap to go over some of the more interesting proposals that you made. The first point I want to look at is what exactly are the type of fees that will be allowed. As a brief background, um, there are generally three different types of uh, fee arrangements that are dependent upon the outcome of the case. If you can accept my graphics here. Uh, first, conditional fees are arrangements where the, if the case succeeds, the lawyer will charge both uh, his normal hourly rate, or sometimes a, re a reduced hourly rate, plus what is called a success fee or an uplift. And this uplift can be either a fixed amount or a percentage of the normal fees, or a percentage of the damages. Uh, contingency fees, on the other hand, means that the council's fees are entirely based on a portion of the damages that are awarded. The third type, speculative fees, is when the attorney charges only his normal hourly rate in the event of success. And note here that all three types are on a no-win, no-fee basis, which means that the lawyer will not get anything if the case is not successful. And that means the lawyers would have to take significant risk. So to introduce more flexibility, some jurisdictions permit a hybrid arrangement or what I call a no-win low fee structure, where uh, the council will still get paid perhaps a, re a reduced fee, even if the case is lost. And I think this is probably the model that will be feasible for most law firms. With this background in mind, let's take a look at the, a look at the Singapore proposal. Um, the consultation paper was only on conditional fee arrangement, and that is defined as agreements where uh, a lawyer receives payment of his legal fees only if the claim is successful, and such payment may include an uplift or success fee. So as we can see here, this would include both conditional and speculative fees, but not contingency fees, and only on a no-win, no-fee basis. In Hong Kong, all we know at this stage is that the subcommittee will study outcome-related fee structures uh, for arbitration. And uh, actually, back in 2005, 2007, the Hong Kong Law Reform Commission looked into potentially introducing conditional fees in domestic litigation context. And at that time, the definition adopted by the commission is this. So if Hong Kong adopts the same definition this time, he would probably consider all three types of fees, fee arrangement that we talked about, uh, including contingency fees, but also on a no win, no fee basis on, only. Here, if we can take the UK as an example, where conditional fees has been, uh, have been legalized since the 1990s. The legislation in England and Wales defines conditional fee agreements as agreement where the lawyer's fees and expenses or any part of them are payable only in specified circumstances. So we can see this is a much broader definition that would also allow for the hybrid, uh, uh, the hybrid arrangements that we just talked about. And the second point, uh, Singapore also proposed to impose certain mandatory safeguards on any conditional fee agreements, including potentially a cooling, a cooling off period, a clear definition of what constitutes success, among others. Uh, what I want to mention here is in addition to these safeguards, the Ministry of Law was also considering whether they should impose a cap on the amount of the success fee that the lawyer will be allowed to charge. Um, here, caps can be a useful tool to prevent lawyers from obtaining a windfall from a case success. But there's a question of um, how the cap should be set. For example, if the rule is the lawyer cannot charge more than 20% of, of the damages, then that could potentially preclude them from representing certain type of cases where the amount in dispute might be relatively small. And it's precisely for this reason that Canada refused to impose a cap on contingency fees. Um, in England, on the other hand, success fees are capped at 100% of what the lawyers would have charged under his normal rates. Um, and I think that probably more accurately reflects the risk associated with each particular case. 
I want to mention two other features of the Singapore proposal. Uh, one is regarding the allocation of cost. If the successful party in an arbitration has a conditional fee arrangement, um, the Singapore proposal says that the order for cost will not include any part of the success or of the fee. As we know, in international arbitration practice, the tribunal usually retain a broad discretion in assessing the reasonableness of a party's legal cost, and it can allocate costs however it deems the most appropriate. Although exclude, excluding success fees may have the benefit of protecting the losing party from being unfairly burdened, it may be better to leave this task to the tribunal as part of its reasonableness determination. Uh, because in some cases, the tribunal may well consider it will be equitable to, to award even the fee, pre, the fee premium. For example, if a party's, in, uh, a party's insolvency is caused by the, rough, the wrongful conduct of the other party. One final point on disclosure. Singapore also proposed that uh, lawyers should be obliged to disclose the existence of a conditional fee agreement to the tribunal as well as the other side. And this is to keep in line with the current regime of third party funding in Singapore, which also requires disclosure. Um, to me, I think it is debatable whether disclosure will be necessary in this context because for one, Unlike the involvement of a third party founder, um, there's no potential conflict of interest concerns with the tribunal because a fee arrangement is purely between the, the party and its counsel already on the already on the record. And secondly, especially if success fees will not be recoverable in any event, it's even harder to justify why disclosure will be necessary. So to conclude, conditional fees like third party funding could benefit companies who may be strapped for cash or simply want a different way to fund their disputes. And this is made especially relevant in the context of COVID-19 when many companies may be unable or unwilling to start an arbitration. So it will be interesting indeed to see what the final legislations in Hong Kong and Singapore would look like and how they each address the issues that we just talked about today. Thank you. Thank you, Kitty. And it's true, I think the severe economic disruption that's caused by COVID-19 has impacted both clients and also a lot of businesses that we're seeing. And arbitration is no different. Um, I'm just going to cover today very briefly the impact of COVID-19 on arbitration. Disputes that we're seeing arising out of COVID-19 and tips on managing them. Some interesting government measures that have come out of here in Singapore and Hong Kong in dealing with COVID-19, which is also relevant for arbitration, and lessons from lockdown that we can all learn um, as a result of COVID-19. Um, I put on this slide a quote from Justice Russell Coleman in which he ruled that a directions hearing could be done by telephone conference. It's in obiter, but he said that the current COVID-19 crisis is actually an opportunity for the courts and parties in litigation to re reassess how cases can best be actively managed. And I think that's largely true for us in, in arbitration as well. Um, in some ways, it's given us a time to reflect on a lot of the procedures and uh, facilities that we already have. For example, here in Hong Kong, the courts were under a general adjourn period from the end of January to early May in which most, uh, unless for urgent hearings, most other court hearings were adjourned. Um, here in Hong Kong, we still have hard copy filing of court documents and there's still a fax machine which is still used for um, communicating with the court. Um, but in contrast, here at the HKIC and also the ICAC, business has kind of continued because um, most communications are done by email in arbitration. Um, the HKIC has introduced precautionary measures as well for parties who are still appearing physically, um, taking temperature checks, and that has kind of allowed you know, business interruption to be quite minimal in respect of arbitration. I guess the biggest impact has been virtual hearings. Um, we've always known about it. It's been provided for in Article 22.4 of the 2018 HKIC rules, Rule 19.1 of the 2016 SEAC rules, um, in which 
tribunals generally have the discretions to order virtual hearings, um, subject to one point I'll make on ICC rules. Um, here in April and May, the HKIC, 85% of all hearings were um, required virtual hearing services and they were heard either in full or in part. And even in our experience, tribunals are keen on pushing ahead. Um, there hasn't been a lot of talk about adjournments and in our experience that tribunals are keen on maintaining fixed merits hearing dates. One thing that has um, logistically uh, been a bit of a challenge is to make sure there's a lot more to be done up front in preparing for a virtual hearing. There's helpfully, there've been a number of protocols that HKIC has guidelines on virtual hearings. Uh, I know the SOL protocol, which is an initiative of the KCAB a few years ago in which they have encouraged the use of electronic bundles. They had minimum technical standards to make sure the hearing ran properly and doing test runs. With that in mind, there's also some procedural and practical issues for all of us to bear in mind. Note that Article 25 of the 2017 ICC rules states that an arbitral tribunal shall hear the parties together in person if any of them so requests. Um, tribunals have often interpreted this to mean that if a party requests a, an in-person hearing, they should err on the side of caution to do so. But I'd also point out in the ICC's guidance note on possible measures on COVID-19, that the ICC has taken a position that that means an adversarial exchange. So it doesn't necessarily exclude virtual hearings as long as both sides have been heard. But just note that Article 5 of the New York Convention on setting aside and also on enforcement has to make sure that the arbitration was conducted in accordance with the agreement of the parties. Um, some practical considerations to do. We, we are currently scheduled for a two-week merits hearing here in the HKIC in October in which our presiding arbitrator is stuck in the UK with another co-arbitrator and we have another, the third arbitrator here in Hong Kong. You know, there are procedural issues in which it's not ideal that the tribunal is scattered and certainly uh, parties should bear that in mind in terms of how you would like the tribunal to have deliberations. It's not ideal that one particular arbitrator may be physically left out of any meetings. Um, witness evidence integrity is something to bear in mind as well when you have a witness or an expert or factual evidence um, witness dialing in. It's important that there's no one else in the room. In the HKIC guidelines, they propose having a hearing invigilator or a local lawyer sit in. There's also 360 degree cameras so that the tribunal can make sure that no one's else in the room prompting any questions. Um, as a practical measure, just note that if you're in different time zones, your own physical body rhythm in getting yourself ready for these type of hearings can take its toll, introduce shorter breaks, um, um, make sure that each particular cross-examination isn't particularly long. Uh, finally, I put up electronic presentation of evidence. Um, there's a lot of um, third party uh, providers like Epic, Opus 2, who for many years had very sophisticated systems. Um, a lot of us have grown up using A5 hard copy bundles, but I think now certainly it's time that a lot of the tribunal has expected that parties get familiar with using electronic evidence. And that can only be a good thing, same as real time live transcription. In terms of disputes we're seeing, obviously the COVID-19 pandemic has caused severe supply chain disruption. You've had closure of factories, travel restrictions. So the disputes we're seeing a lot are coming out of post M&A disputes. Um, manufacturing and also logistic and hospitality disputes. Um, as a point for clients, it's important to check the express terms of your contract and check whether you have a force majeure or a material adverse change clause and the impacts of it. Force majeure is generally considered as an act of God or it's often drafted as circumstances beyond a party's reasonable control. It often states the triggering events in the clause and you can check whether epidemic or pandemic is expressly listed. Um, note that for force majeure clauses, it's often that a party is prevented from performing and that's been interpreted to mean impossible. Um, there's a leading English decision of Fame Valley Power in 2006 in which Total was meant to provide gas um, and supply gas um, in England and in, in which the gas prices had gone um, exponentially high and it was no longer fit commercially viable for Total to provide. That English court didn't necessarily find that just because it was more expensive that you couldn't supply gas. 
So same arising out of COVID, make sure to check how is it really impacting you. Material adverse change is a common clause in facility and loan documentation. It allows a purchaser to pull out before completion or allows a bank to call their event of default. Um, we're involved in a current arbitration at the moment in, in arising out of circumstances just in April in Hong Kong in which our client um, was a seller of a business and within a week of signing the SPA, um, the, the buyer pulled out of the deal citing COVID-19 in Hong Kong and refused to pay the purchase price of 10 million US dollars. Um, this is something that um, I think parties should be aware of and note that knowledge and foreseeability is an important aspect of triggering a MAC clause. Um, the leading case is Grupo in England of 2013 in which it's important to know that what were the circumstances that, that existed at the time of signing the contract and whether that had really materially changed. Materiality is judged by reference to the interest that the clause seeks to protect. It's often significant or appreciably. Um, and the change must not just be merely temporary. So um, once the WHO had announced um, back in February that it was a pandemic of COVID-19, it should be well known that most contractual parties who had entered into SPA agreements since then would have been put on notice. Um, if you don't have express clauses, note that you also can rely on the common law doctrine of frustration. Um, this has um, been interpreted to mean, you know, it, that the contract was impossible to perform, but it has to be radically different from what was undertaken. So the leading case is Davis Constructors of 1956, in which the House of Lords ruled that um, a construction company in England um, who had contracted to build a series of houses over a period of eight months took 22 months and it cost more. And the, the con contractor sought to get extra payment of its fees. Um, the court didn't feel that that caused frustration. It wasn't impossible to perform. Economic harshness is insufficient for proving that. Um, in this current climate, as when you have supply chain issues, um, it's, it's also important to note whether your supply contract specified a particular type of good in a particular type of place. So the leading English case of Howell and Copeland of 1876 dealt with potatoes that came from a particular farm uh, and a particular type of potato with a particular supplier in which um, some disease went into the crops and half of it got destroyed. Um, the court actually felt that there was frustration in that particular case because the contract provided that the potatoes had to come from a particular farm. So similarly, if you have a product that is only manufactured in Wuhan, in Hubei province, in China, and there's no other substitute, um, and it's specifically provided for in your contract, that's something that you can look at as well that may be able to rely. The last time this was considered in Hong Kong was um, the SARS um, epidemic. And in Li Ching Wing in 2004, a tenant sought to terminate the tenancy agreement um, that they had signed for two years um, on the reasons that the block had a number of cases and that the health department had closed that particular apartment block for 10 days. The court felt, well, that didn't quite, at first it wasn't, it was an unforeseeable event, but it did not significantly change your tenancy agreement and it only took 10 days out of two years. Um, so those are a type of the cases that we're seeing, just note there is a risk that if you wrongfully terminate, you know, you'll be liable for reputatory breach and damages. The key takeaways are look at the contract, the express terms of your contract, look at the specific facts arising out of it. If there were practical tips on how to manage this, we've asked clients to consider renegotiating the terms, making sure, you know, any variation is in writing. If not, reserve your rights. It has to be an express reservation of rights so that you're not considered to have waived their non-performance either by your words or by conduct. In terms of government measures, I've just noted two interesting things that have arose um, out of COVID-19. One is the Singapore Temporary Measures Act. Effectively, this is a statutory moratorium for disputes. It gives breathing space um, and offers temporary relief for specified businesses and individuals in Singapore who can't fulfill their contracts. Um, it applies to uh, specific scheduled contracts that includes loan contracts, um, construction and supply contracts, event contracts and tourism related ones and leases. 
if your contract was entered into before the 24th of March this year, with performance due from 1st of February and after, for six months, um, uh, that you aren't allowed to commence or continue any court proceedings or enforce security or winding up against that party. Um, there is an exception for international arbitration, so uh, being seated in Singapore, so one of your counterparties is outside of Singapore, or the main performance of those obligations of the contract is outside of Singapore. Um, it does, this, this particular act doesn't apply, but it does apply to domestic arbitration. Um, it allows uh, that party to have some bit of breathing room while its inability to perform was based materially caused by COVID. In Hong Kong recently, the Department of Justice announced an online dispute resolution scheme in partnership with eBram, in which for a claim that's less than 500,000 in Hong Kong, which is about 65,000 US dollars, and as long as the party, uh, one of parties is Hong Kong resident or a company, by paying a $200 Hong Kong registration fee, you can enter into a dispute resolution agreement in which your, your, your small value dispute um, arising out of COVID in which you can negotiate, mediate, and then arbitrate in a very, very short period of time. Um, it'll be determined by a third party neutral assessor of their choice. And this is kind of um, an interesting initiative that allows uh, small disputes um, to be dealt with on a very quick expedited basis. Um, it's an important initiative and it's also done online. Um, uh, so there wouldn't be a, a hear, physical hearing unless the parties requested it. In terms of lessons from lockdown, just to conclude, um, what can we learn after reflecting on all of this? I think one is to consider early settlement. Um, it's something that's provided for in the civil justice reform for court proceedings. Um, but I think it's something that arbitration can also take on board. Lord Phillips and Lord Newberger recently said in the British Institute of International and Comparative Law um, seminar in a note in which they encourage conciliation. Where possible, in the first instance, try to continue with a viable contract rather than bringing it to an immediate end. As we've seen before, there are also risks for wrongful termination. What we've seen from clients is that it's important to control time and costs now more than ever, especially where cash flows are low and um, revenues are low for a lot of clients. But we already have a lot of these procedures in the rules. We have virtual hearings. You can have an expedited procedure in which your dispute can be resolved within six months. We can have expert determin uh, uh, early determination procedure in which if there's particular issues that are manifestly um, without merit, they can be determined at an early stage. Or things like uh, a Kaplan opening in which you can have issues heard earlier. In anything that is um, able to demonstrate the benefits of arbitration of both being flexible but also being cost efficient. Um, because of the impact of terms of cash flow and costs, we've also seen clients turn their minds now early on to preservation of assets. Consider getting emergency relief early, interim measures, and also security for the ward. I know um, Edward would soon talk about interim measures, but it's also an important uh, toolkit for, for council to use so that who knows whether your counterparty will remain a going concern in a year or two's time once your arbitration has commenced, especially it could be they're in the hospitality industry, the aviation industry, you're not sure whether they're gonna be around. Security for the ward, like in La Dolce Vita, with which Justice Mimi Chan ordered security for 40% of the total award. These are also useful tools of having cash in hand. And as Kitty just earlier mentioned, I think third party funding of arbitration is probably a nice, this is probably its moment. We've seen clients who, who don't have cash, but have a very valid dispute. And just if they only had funding, they could pursue it. And I think this is a time in which sometimes you need an event to allow you to utilize um, the legislation that you already have. I just bear in mind though that a lot of third party funders though will still require that you have a very good merits uh, case um, and a minimum threshold usually of about 10 million US dollars and that enforcement is likely to be possible. Um, but I think these are important lessons that we can all learn um, and coming out of COVID-19.
um, yeah, in terms of <coughs> talking about the intermeshes and uh, the game changing mutual system between Hong Kong and mainland China, which was uh, regarded as the, the most uh, massive achievement last year in Hong Kong arbitration, I think. Um, I believe that uh, most of people have uh, read or learned a lot of things about what is the arrangement talking about. And uh, also that I noticed uh, there are the six uh, institutions, most of the six institutions and government uh, and the arrangement have been used with their guidance. So I will not go through any detail of the arrangement itself, but only uh, make the uh, four highlights uh, as a background to the arrangement. First, that uh, the figures I posted in the PowerPoint is already uh, outdated. And uh, I'm very pleased to hear uh, just uh, for now that uh, the applications made to the HKIC under this uh, arrangement um, is that the value of the applications is more than RMB 7.1 billion. Uh, and uh, that is about US dollar, uh, more than 1 billion uh, US dollars. And also the value of orders made is more than RMB 5 billion. Um, so the, I believe and really important. And second, I'd like to make is, uh, uh, is that, um, the reason, the reason why um, the China, mainland China and Hong Kong reached this, uh, uh, this arrangement, arrangement is simply because that, that from the Central People's, People's Government's government perspective, that, that they always want to support Hong Kong to maintain and enhance its status as the regional international dispute uh, resolution center, and that, that is indeed uh, reaffirmed in the 13th five years plan. And, and also, also the last year, uh, the Greater Bay Area uh, uh, Development Plan. Um, and and, and this, this is one of the commitments the commitment made, made by the central government to support Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Um, and uh, again, and this, this is very unique, unique support uh, given, given by, by the central government, government because except, except and now except, except uh, uh, Hong Kong, there's no other jurisdictions have this privilege to uh, uh, for, for the other uh, arbitral proceedings to uh, make an implication to the Chinese court for the interim measure. And Hong Kong is the first and only legal venue outside of mainland China to have this right. And uh, and last, last uh, the, 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 the next two backgrounds that I'd like to, uh, to make is that first, um, it should be uh, the six eligible arbitral institutions can apply for the interim measures. That, uh, that means uh, if you commence the arbitration in the other uh, arbitral institutions which are not in the list, then you are not eligible to make it. And also, uh, it does not in uh, include any ad hoc arbitration. For example, most of the shipping cases are referred to uh, ad hoc arbitration. And understand that uh, uh, the, uh, the Department of Justice, Justice in Hong Kong and uh, are also negotiating with uh, uh, mainland Chinese authorities in this in this regard. But the hurdle is that in China, so far, before any amendments to the arbitration law, um, the ad hoc arbitration is not yet recognized. Um, so uh, that's probably the hurdle. So let's move on to the application uh, procedures. As I said, that I was very privileged to be the first applicant, successful applicant, to uh, to get the order from uh, the Shanghai Maritime Court on 8th, 8th of October last year, which is the first working day after the arrangement came into effect. That is uh, uh, first of October, and at that time, actually, most of the all the parties in in this application were very keen to uh, to to achieve it, so that. Uh, so that we, uh, we, we, we got the first application. And the most thing is, I think, I will not repeat uh, whatever already stated in the paper. Uh, we have a lot of papers, including that I wrote a few, a few articles. And also there are practical guidance issued by HKC and other institutions. But what is important is that it's very unnecessary to find the appropriate local Chinese lawyer to help you in that application so that he can 
communicate in advance with the relevant judges of that court to see that whether the court will be happy to, see, to receive this application. And so far, uh, as I know that when the application was the pending or not really successful, most of the reason is that uh, because of the lack of uh, uh, pre-communications between the applicant and the local court, so that they even didn't understand what's, what you are making for and what is the, about, uh, what is the arrangement about. And that is the first practical note that I'd like to make. And second is, of course, that under the current arrangement, there are uh, uh, three basically uh, interim measures allowed uh, which are property preservation, evidence preservation, and conduct pres preservation. Um, these are also very, uh, 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 very significant because uh, previously, uh, for example, like shipping cases, it was actually proper, uh, 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 possible for the parties to make the property preservation under a special uh, maritime uh, a maritime procedure under Chinese law, because uh, for the for the applicant, they can apply to the maritime court to arrest the vessel or any bankers or cargo carried on the vessel. Uh, but no other uh, no further uh, further applications like the uh, like the conduct preservation or evidence. But now it applies to all kind of commercial arbitrations that uh, uh, we can apply for this kind of uh, preservations to the relevant Chinese courts. So it's important that you you, you come out with uh, with your 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 Chinese lawyer uh, um, that how to ensure that you can prepare all the necessary uh, documents in one go and then to to make it happen as soon as possible because as we all know that uh, the the purpose of intermeasure application is to ensure that the, the thing you want to preserve can be preserved. So uh, uh, time is always uh, 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 sensitive. And, and then I would move on to the second part of my uh, uh, short presentation is actually uh, the cost of the arbitration and the cost of the measures applications. It also happened to my first case as well because we got 100% uh, successful in our arbitration uh, uh, given uh, uh, given by the HKIC uh, tribunal here, and then we made, of course, the application for the enforcement of the award in Shanghai, and later on, of course, under the arbitration, we applied to the tribunal, uh, sinking the costs, and we were uh, given a favorable uh, a cost award as well, except for the costs uh, incurred by us on the intermeasure applications. Uh, especially for the Shanghai lawyers part, and also uh, all, all the, the, the fees that we spend on the interim measure application. The reason given by the tribunal is that it is an ancillary application, uh, an ancillary proceedings, which is not really uh, uh, the, the arbitration proceedings uh, of their jurisdiction in this matter. So make us a bit uh, 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 Awkward because from the client's perspective, that because we we explain to the clients that okay, cost for event that is a principle, and we it seems that we won the case that we should be we should get a, a successful cost of a cost for order as well, and especially that our intermediate application was successful as well, and then the the tribunal gave, gave a, a, a short reason in their award saying that, as I said. Um, if there's a difference between cost of the arbitration and the cost of the reference. And we have later on uh, definitely uh, researched on this. And uh, honestly speaking, I agree with the tribunal. But, uh, they, they were correct uh, that, that the, the interim application costs cannot be really apply, uh, applied or, 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 or given by the Hong Kong tribunal. Uh, this, I think there are two major reasons, reasons is that if traditionally we would make the application to the Hong Kong court for the interim measure uh, um, support, and then if we, we succeed in the application, then we can apply to the Hong Kong court for the relevant costs. And the Hong Kong court will apply, of course, the, the, uh, the general principle to, uh, to make the, the costs uh, uh, order. Uh, that is also the view from the tribunal. And then the tribunal also said that, okay, 
can apply to the relevant Chinese court for that uh, for that uh, court order. And then we talk to the Shanghai Maritime Court, and that is a position and the Chinese law is that they may only allow to uh, support um, the, the, the applicant party for the application, uh, application fees, which is uh, basically nominal, uh, it's nothing. But they can. There's no cost follow event uh, principle in China, and they basically do not give any uh, cost order in favor of the successful uh, uh, party, unless the other side, well, probably the losing party can apply for the cost order against the successful uh, against the other applicant if the applicant make the application in uh, in a bad manner, in a, in a bad face. So that's probably the only reason. So I think uh, we, we, take, we, we take the view that, okay, if this is really, really the position under, under Hong Kong law and the Chinese law, then why not that we seek a, a, a way to, uh, in order to, propo uh, to promote the application and the arrangement to allow the successful party to have the right uh, for the cost of this, uh, interim measure applications made by the relevant uh, 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 tribunal in Hong Kong, because uh, it is uh, the whole purpose of this arrangement is to, in, to, to facilitate the parties in these two uh, jurisdictions in, uh, in respect of arbitration. And then if we can allow the party, the successful party to uh, have the right of uh, costs, then that will definitely further uh, strengthen the use of the arrangement. That concludes my uh, speech. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for sharing these very insightful remarks from, as I mentioned at the start, a range of topics. Um, Yishen, um, I, I like what you said earlier um, about how a lot of lawyers have grown used to A5 bundles and using hard copies. And even though COVID-19 has presented a lot of uh, challenges to dispute resolution. It also provides a good opportunity for us to revisit some of the um, practices. Um, so we have a question um, from the audience um, on suggested best practices for the use of electronic evidence at hearings, uh, either in person or virtual. Um, I wonder if you have um, any thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, thank, thank you, Joanne, and thank you for the question from the audience. Um, I think whether it's a physical hearing or a virtual hearing, if you're going to use electronic presentation of evidence, it's making sure that the tribunal and all the parties have access to that shared platform. Um, and also just in terms of practicalities, um, that everyone has access to the screens that they're using. Most important is that the tribunal can see everything and having a test run with the, a third party provider and having an electronic manager on hand just in case the technical difficulties to make sure that the tribunal can see everything. But I think it is helpful now, putting aside whether it's a virtual hearing or not, just because as a practical matter now, by having everything electronically and your hearing bundle, which can last you know, many lever arch folders or A5 bundles, is that you can have hyperlinks through to exhibits, through your opening submissions, or through witness statements, so you don't have to turn to various pages. I've also found it helpful that you can, um, if you need to update your bundles, just as a practical matter, you know, you know I, I, back in the day, I used to do hard copy pagination. <laughs> and so it's it's now quite unique that documents will arise, uh, either as a product of document production or also uh, new evidence, and it's easier to be updated. Um, in terms of best practices, a lot of that is already in the protocols. So the ICC guidance note on COVID-19, it has a protocol checklist in the appendix, that, which goes through some of these things that you need to bear in mind in terms of practical measures that you can do. Um, but a lot of that is already out there. And I, I think it, um, for council or for parties is to agree a protocol and then everyone's on the same page for using that. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> I think a lot of uh, trainees and, and juniors must be very happy that they now get to use these cool technologies <laughs> rather than high copy pagination. Um, uh, the second question I have maybe one for, for Yvonne. Um, so we've heard from uh, Edward um, about how, how great the interim measures arrangement is. And, and it does seem uh, that now when you are faced with a PRC counter 
party um, choosing Hong Kong arbitration uh, would, would seem to make uh, the best sense. Um, but we also heard from you at the start, um, the last Moss case, it, it remains a uh, good law. Um, there are a lot of obiter remarks, though, saying, oh, has the case gone too far? Um, uh, does it uh, undermine creditors' ability to bring winding up petitions? Um, so th there is a bit of tension uh, between like, arbitration, uh, going for arbitration, and, and preserving the ability to bring winding up petitions. Um, what are your, your views on, on that? Um, that's, that's a good question. And essentially, that was the concern that the Court of Appeal raised in the Bat Ka Chon case. Um, even though they didn't disturb the last month's approach, the issue was that you know the test seemingly um, favors arbitration and undermines creditors' ability to wind up insolvent companies. But I don't think it necessarily will affect you know parties' decisions. Um, you know in in and drive parties away from arbitration. Um, if anything, I think the cases from the past few years, from the past year, so those few cases have shown that actually the Hong Kong courts are quite sensible and pragmatic um, when approaching this sort of issue. Um, and also the last month's approach, it's not an absolute rule. There are still certain exceptions under it. And I think um, again, the, the cases recently have shown that there actually is some room for flexibility in its interpretation and application. Um, so I think in practice, if, for example, you have a debtor company who's actually insolvent but trying to perhaps misuse the arbitration clause um, to oppose a winding up petition, there's probably sufficient room under the last Moss approach um, and also other measures available to the courts um, to deal with that. Um, and of course, taking a broader step back, one must not forget the many other benefits of arbitration. So I think that's where the balance still lies. All right. Um, the, the next question, uh, we have uh, two more minutes, so uh, a quick one uh, for, for Kitty, um, uh, touching on flexibility. Um, you mentioned a lot of different flexible arrangements in, in doing conditional uh, fees um, proposed by, by different jurisdictions. Um, for Hong Kong, though, it seems like that consultation is uh, limited to uh, arbitration. Um, I just wonder whether um, you have any thoughts on whether you see any scope of that being expanded to litigation in the future. Yes, um, I think there would certainly be a longer wait for Hong Kong to open up conditional fees in court proceedings. And this is because I think, first of all, the old common law doctrine of chambertian and maintenance is still not formally abandoned in Hong Kong. And this is also the reason why third party funding at, at the moment is still, uh, is also limited to arbitration proceedings right. only. And uh, in addition, Hong Kong actually uh, con uh, looked into potentially introducing conditional fees in the domestic litigation context back in 2005, 2007. And the law commission concluded at that time that the time was not ripe yet. Mm -hmm. But their main concern is that the domestic legal aid and insurance scheme would have to be reformed as well mm -hmm. to protect the losing party from a heightened cost liability. But if the conditional fee legislation could uh, for for domestic contact could include enough safeguard, for example, introducing a cap or mandating that the cost order would not include any part of the success fee, then that could potentially address the commission's concern at that time. Mm -hmm. So I think it's certainly possible that somewhere down the road, yeah. this is certainly Hong Kong City is taking a step towards potentially introducing it right. to court context as well. That that's good to hear. Um, so so something to to for us all to watch out for. Um, so on, on that note, uh, we're right on our uh, one hour mark. Um, I just want to finish uh, for, for thanking um, all our panel members today um, again for, for the interesting uh, sharing and also to thank all audience members um, from Dowling Yin from everywhere. So thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.